but it, but from this from a from a corporate point of view, I was trying to make the case that it made more sense for him to take over RTC if he wanted to put himself in a position where he held real power over Scientology, because he's the guy who is the ter- the determining factor as to who gets the trademarks and service marks and who doesn't. And back in the 80s, that meant more than it does now, too, because they were really big on enforcing their trademark standards. And there were people who had left the Church of Scientology, high-level people, people who had worked right under Hubbard, who tried to form their own Churches of Scientology, their own independent act activities. And they got squashed. I mean, they just got legally and, uh, and, and illegally squashed hard by David Miscavige and by RTC using those trademark laws, right? They took them to court. And, uh, and that's how they got rid of those guys. So, so there was power to be had in having control of those trademarks and stuff. Sure. Yeah. That's power, yeah. Yeah. And this is now, okay, so Hubbard dies. They hold an event and they announce this fact to everybody. And David Miscavige is the MC of this event. And this was the first time that most people had ever seen or heard of David Miscavige outside of the Sea Org. So now he's this little guy on stage in a white uniform, and everybody's kind of like, who's this guy? You know? And he looks important and he talks like he's important, and he's emceeing this event, and he's and they're talking about L. Ron Hubbard's legacy and how it's going to go forward into the future. This was also the only public appearance that I'm aware of of Pat Broker, the guy who had been with Hubbard up until the end. Uh, he was also on the stage, and he made promises about how L. Ron Hubbard had done further research into these OT levels, and there was all this stuff, and they were going to release it, and it was going to be amazing. So there was this sort of, the whole point of that, of that announcement of L. Ron Hubbard's dying event was not to just announce Hubbard's death, but to also make it clear that the church was going to continue, and this was the leadership that, this, that the church was going to be under. So Miscavige didn't have to announce that he was the guy in charge of everything. He just sort of assumed that people got that. And, um, and then he continued running things from behind the scenes. You know, at the upper, upper, upper levels, you don't have to make daily public appearances for people to know you're in charge. They just see your name on things from, from time to time, and they got know. Got it. So it just becomes kind of a transition into that. Exactly. Not, not necessarily requiring some big formal announcement, it sounds like. Exactly. Okay. So, so he was just kind of there, right? Um, there's a, still a lot of people at the upper levels of Scientology. Management actually was existing. It was running. There was a structure in place. Miscavige was the head of this thing, but he was dealing with the IRS problem now. And, and now that Hubbard had died, all those court cases were not really as important anymore. I mean, they were important, but now that L. Ron Hubbard, you know, was not, he was named as a defendant, but, you know, nobody was going to depose L. Ron Hubbard now. So, uh, so that kind of took a lot of stress off that whole all clear project and all of that stuff, right? So now Miscavige's focus was entirely on church survival. And the main threat to that survival was the IRS. So he was working with the lawyers. He was working with legal. They also had these other independent Scientology groups popping up that had to be squashed. And they had the day-to-day operations of the church. And so there was a management level structure that was kind of running the church's day-to-day, week-to-week operations. And Miscavige was no longer totally, you know, so involved in all of that. The IRS problem became front and center, and Miscavige was orchestrating legal maneuvers, private investigations of IRS employees. Uh, There were something like 1,400 lawsuits brought against the IRS by individual Scientologists. There was a PR campaign being run. There was a a thing the church was publishing called Freedom Magazine, which was uh, doing monthly exposés on, on IRS abuses. And the IRS was an abusive organization. They, you know, they would get involved in some pretty crazy, nonsensical stuff. And they would break the laws and enforcing tax codes. And they were kicking families out of their homes. And, you know, all the crap that the IRS gets up to. 
Well, the church was highlighting all that stuff, right? They were making a big deal about it. And they were, they were trying to get Senate hearings. They were really going to town, taken down, you know, on taking down the IRS to the point that Miscavige even narrated and starred in a video proposing an alternative tax system. And they proposed a VAT tax in America. And they said, do away with the IRS entirely. We don't need them. Let's <laughs> just replace it with a sales tax. I remember when that was in politics, the, the, yeah, the value added tax. Yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah. So they were kind of hopping on that bandwagon, all in the direction of trying to get the IRS to capitulate and give them back tax exempt status and clear the books. That was the goal. There wasn't any other target in sight but that. And it was literally live or die for the Church of Scientology. You know, the structure was in place. They had uh, started in 1986, 87, 88. They had started an extremely successful Dianetics promotional campaign. Um, it, you know, the, remember those with the questions? And then Dianetics, right? They'd say like, you know, they, what's, what's the thing that's ruining your life? Page 13, right? And, and what's the single source of problems for mankind? Page 56. And, and then Dianetics would appear on the, on the commercial, right? And they'd be like, ooh, Dianetics. This is, this is the book that has the answers to all those questions they're posing about your personal problems and, and the problems you're having in life. This was a very successful campaign. Dianetics became a bestseller again for like a hundred straight weeks or something in nineteen in the nineteen eighties, right, you know, okay. like 35, 30, 37 years after it was published. So, so that happened, and that was all happening under Miscavige's watch. But it wasn't being ordered by him; it was being done by dedicated Sea Org members who, you know, had a vision of actually trying to promote Dianetics and Scientology and and get it, you know, get it going again. So, so that worked. Ironically, the guy who came up with that whole campaign has got kicked out of the church by Miscavige years later for, for being a, a horrible, awful person. I know him. He's a, he's a friend of mine. 